Your Humanities Half Hour is brought to you by the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Welcome to Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry. Who has the right and responsibility to challenge conventional or colonial historiography? That's a question raised by Dr. Laura Torres Souter at a presentation she made at the University of Guam under the Micronesian Area Research Center seminar series. Dr. Souter believes... Indigenous historians have that right and responsibility. And she says for too long, the only written accounts of Mariana's history were offered by those who told the line of great men, great deeds. This so-called official documentation of our lived experience has marginalized Indigenous people to the point that their history became a story of what other people did on our shores. Today, we're going to offer excerpts from that lecture here now is Dr. Laura Torres Souter with her lecture, Chamorro Revision, Redefining Historical Periods. Before I begin uh, this little journey of Chamorro Revisionism, re- Redefining Historical Periods, I really want to thank you all for coming. I do see many, many friends. I see relatives. I see colleagues. I see teachers. I see sisters, uh, the class of 68 is represented here, and that's a very dear, near and dear uh, classification to me. I see young children, my nephews, uh, my niece, my nieces. I see people who care. I see my friends, uh, and I know the sacrifice that some people make to come here, (laughs) but I really do appreciate it. I really do appreciate it. You know, this is a lonely business. And when we don't uh, get the kind of warmth and nurturance that we need, uh, sometimes uh, we feel that, you know, we challenge ourselves into thinking, well, why do it at all? But the reason why we do it is because we care about our history, we care about our people, we care about the continuity of our peoplehood. And that's what Chamorro Revisionism is directed toward. It's about nation building, It's about discovering who we are from the perspective that has not been well established. It's about exploring things that we didn't feel we had the right to explore in the first place. So what gives us the right? I want to set the record straight. History is about storytelling. And every human being has a story to tell. And we all have the right to tell that story. And Chamorros have the responsibility to tell the story of our ancestors in the way that we've not had an opportunity to do that before. And so that's part of what I'm going to be talking about. I have slides. Uh, I want you to read along with me or listen to me as I read some of these points because they're important. But more importantly, I want you to think about taking a journey with me through a different scenario about writing history so that you understand where I'm coming from. Because if you know me, you know I advocate first and foremost for the Chamorro language. If we're, as Sammy said in his um, column on Sunday, speaking Chamorro is teaching Chamorro. And speaking Chamorro is also empowering ourselves to become revisionist historians, to discover what our ancestors are telling us through our language. Have we heard our ancestors calling us to tell their story and ours? Because that's what this is all about. If we look at the way history is commonly written on Guam today, and we look at the way it's been written in the past, it's not amazing to come up with the question, well, where, where were the Chamorros in all of this? What were they doing? What were they thinking? What were they feeling? How did they respond? That's what I'm talking about. 
the missing link. So when we think about historical revisionism, what does it mean? It is reinterpreting the historical record, offering a different perspective. It doesn't mean that perspectives that have been offered are wrong. It simply means that they're incomplete and we have to complete the story. It is challenging conventional historiography. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means in the, in the you know, context of Guam history. Why challenge conventional historiography? Why don't we just leave it alone? Well, revisionists believe that conventional historiography is incomplete. It's an exclusive portrayal of history that leaves out the experiences of ordinary people. And this is not just applicable to Guam history, it's applicable to history the world over. So revisionists have been working hard since the turn of the 18th to the 19th century to fill in the blank, so to speak, to reinterpret what was always considered to be the truth, right? Conventional his historiography is often elitist and sexist. It leaves out women. It leaves out the experiences of ordinary people. It's commonly known as the great men, great deeds type of history. So every child on Guam learns about George Washington, right? About Abraham Lincoln, about the presidents. But do our children learn about our Magatlahi and our Magathaga? Do they learn about the wise people in their own families? No. They learn about the redwoods of California, but they don't learn about the ifit of Sinahanya if there are ephid trees in Sinania, and I planted one. Um, you know what I mean? It's not bad to learn about the redwoods. It's not bad to learn about the Algonquins, right? Because they teach that in second grade. Liam shared his social studies book with me, and the Algonquins were in the first chapter. It's not bad. But is it good that they're not learning about the first peoples of our lands? That's the question. And conventional historiography assumes one interpretation of historical events is the most factual or authentic. So people like me and others who do history quibble about authenticity and validation. And who do you, how do you know that this is true? And my question is always, how do we know that it isn't? What if it is? I have a right to interpret, right? So historians interpret events and people that happen in time. That's what historians do. And who says we can't be historians of our own experience? That's the question. The goal then of indigenous historiography or Chamorro revisionism is to redirect our historical narrative and place ourselves and our ancestors as the primary actors in our collective historical experience. So how do we do that? In other words, it is the telling of our story, our lived experience, and our ethos, our worldview, beliefs, myths, legends, and rituals by indigenous storytellers using our cultural insights, our mata. Now this doesn't mean, as I said before, that we throw out or discount written history from the conventional view. It doesn't mean that we uh, create a bonfire at Mark, right? Because that's where many of the historical treasures are kept. The goal is to balance the historical account by offering culturally informed perspectives. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to balance historical interpretation, not do away with one at the, you know, or create one at the expense of another. People have often asked me, well, are the accounts and the stories and the reports and the letters written by missionaries Explorers, colonial administrators, adventurers, anthropologists, archaeologists, and linguists, some of who are in this room, have provided valuable contributions for indigenous revisionists to sharpen insightful interpretations. 
All of that is good. It's inherently sound. But if it's the only thing that drives our understanding of our historical experience, then it's incomplete. And our ancestors didn't write us letters. They didn't jot down their historical observations. But we can still tell their story because they gave us something that is priceless. They gave us their language. And in our language are embedded secret codes of information about what, who they are, how they think, how they name, how they express. And it helps us to, in, in the interpretive process. Creating culturally informed interpretations builds on facts, not fiction. This is another bone of contention between conventional historiographers and revisionists. And on Guam, believe me, we have these kinds of discussions. Maybe not face to face, maybe behind the back, but we have these kinds of discussions. You know, how does she know that that fact is, that that's a fact, that that's true? How do we know that phrase, what Freysene wrote is true? Right? There are many ways to validate observation. But just because we don't write it in books doesn't mean that it didn't exist or that you can't think it. And so that's part of the, the, um, the only book from my point of view that uh, is unchallengeable is the Bible. Everything else can be challenged as far as I'm concerned. So, you know, we have to get used to this idea. We're not comfortable with the idea that we actually have the authority and the responsibility to offer interpretation. We're not comfortable with that. And that's why there are not very many Guam historians who are Chamorro because of that reason. Our seed of wisdom our, ne our nexus of knowledge, if you will, lies in Finotsamoru, or also known as Finohadza. That's where the wisdom comes from. That's what, gave, that's what our ancestors gave us. And that's where we can discover so much about how our ancestors thought. We're listening to Dr. Laura Torres Souter, and we'll be back with more after this break. Did you know that you can donate up to $5,000 to the Humanities Council through the CNMI Education Tax Credit Program? Donations from individuals and corporations qualify and can be used to offset your local wage and salary tax, BGRT, and earnings tax. Call our office at 235-4785 to see how you can support humanities programs in our community and obtain a tax credit for your donation. Sizu Usma'asi, Olomai, and thank you. We return now to our excerpts from the lecture of Dr. Laura Torres Souter on Chamorro Revision, Redefining Historical Periods, as presented in 2018 as part of the Micronesian Area Research Center seminar series. Armata allows Chamorro revisionists to see things from the inside out. You know, we talk about Halum Tutsa. The child uh, first becomes aware of the world from the, from the womb. We even have Puntantonu, Tuzantonu, the Duendis, they live in the inside of our, of our land. All of those references show a great reverence to internal wisdom, to internal spaces to sacred spaces from within. So as compared to conventional historiography on Guam, which is written from the outside looking in, what Chamorro revisionism does is it allows, it allows us to look at history, at events, at big events, small events, time, from the inside out. 
okay? What do I mean? Okay, so let's look at the conventional way our story is laid out in historical accounts. Everybody who's had even a little bit of Guam history knows these periods. And for God's sake, let's get rid of this notion that Guam's history began in 1521. Okay, that was an event in Magellan's life. It did have an impact on the lives of our ancestors. But our ancestors, who were among the great navigators of the Pacific, first settled in our homeland around 3,500 to 4,000 years ago. So 1521 is just a drop in the bucket in that historical record, right? It isn't the beginning. It's not itutuhonta, as we would say. How do we know? Well, linguists, archaeology, forensic anthropology, our ancestors themselves through their human remains, their artifacts, and enduring traditional practices which we still connect with today, tell us much about who they were and where they came from. We know that they were part of a seafaring community that began to populate the island Pacific about 5,000 years ago. They came to the Marianas about 4,000 years ago. And there are human remains and artifactual remains that document that. So we know how long ago they settled. We know what they found in terms of the land. They found a place that was not human, that there, where there was no human habitation. So they decided to settle here, those first navigators. Their remains, like the Lati structures and so on and so forth, give us an idea of how they lived and how they buried their dead. What kind of social structure they had. What kind of kinship arrangements they had. The traditions that we continue to practice today, the values and beliefs we hold dear, our perspective on the world, all of this has been passed down for centuries. For, we calculated this a while ago, for 150 generations. That's a lot of generations. Through the Chamorro language. Our language is the primary source or wellspring of our mata. If we view history solely through the eyes of those who came to our shores in the 16th century and beyond, we have a very limited perspective about the people of the land, Imanau Tautono. This is that periodization that we're most uh, familiar with, right? We talk about Guam history, and we identify that there's a pre-contact era. So if contact occurred in 1521, then everything behind that is pre-contact. We talk about the Spanish colonial era. Usually we define this as the time when Legaspi came, claimed Guam for Queen Mariana, and that uh, extended to the period 1898 when the Spanish-American War was fought and we were part of the spoils. We talk about the early American naval era, beginning with Captain Glass coming in and claiming Guam for the United States uh, through the Second World War. We talk about the Japanese occupation, only four years in chronological time but very significant years in terms of the experience of the Chamal people. Then we talk about the post-war American era. Civilian government, naval government, then civilian government. And then we talk about Guamanian contemporary era. Look at the way these periods line up. Who is the focus of each of these periods? In pre-contact, what is the focus? Tell me. Contact, right? Contact. The outsiders. Who is the focus in the Spanish colonial era? The Spanish. Who is the focus in the early American naval era? The Americans. 
Who's the focus in the Japanese occupation? The Japanese. Who's the focus in the post-war American era? The Americans. Who's the focus in the Guamanian contemporary era? Guamanians. Guamanians are residents of Guam. The whole, all the people of Guam, right? Do you see tomorrows in any of these periods? That's the point. The point is, is that tomorrows are hidden in plain sight because our experience as, as, a, as a people runs through all of these periods, but it doesn't seem like we're predominant players, right? That's what revisionism is about. It's to correct this, this uh, paradigm, to flesh it out, flush it out, so that it can be more well uh, represented of the experience of the people who went through it all, right? The storyline of the Chamorro people that is hidden in plain sight. We begin by asking different questions, we begin to explore and uncover our story. In the 1980s, a group of us who were teaching uh, Guam history and other courses at the University of Guam, began this journey of writing different interpretations and challenging different interpretations. And we put all of our thoughts in this collection of readings called Chamorro Self-Determination, Itiretzota. Believe me, we got slammed every which way by the history department, by the professors who were attached with uh, Mark, we got slammed. It takes a lot of courage to depart from the norm, okay? But we began that effort, and then Tony Palomo wrote his book, An Island in Agony, and he wrote it from the perspective of the Chamorro people. What resulted from my journey became my book, Daughters of the Island, which Mark published as its first monograph, so I think, you know, by then, they got used to our departing from the norm and um, began to recognize that we had a story to tell. We just had to muster the courage to tell it. Some of you know uh, Tony as Melia. Melia wrote this book, or Melia Ramirez. He wrote this book, uh, La Sangre Llama, which is about bloodlines, which is about genealogy. And that's an, a, another rich source for us to trace our roots and know how our families went where and who they married and even the no-no kinds of uh, relationships that, that were had and how we are so mezclat today, how we are so mixed genetically today because we, have a, we come from a very rich genetic pool. Dr. Uggen, Catherine Uggen wrote a, uh, or led the writing of a series uh, called Haleta. And that was another major effort to begin to create balance in our story. Don Farrell wrote uh, the, Mariana I the history of the Mariana Islands uh, from partition onward. That was another effort to look at the Marianas and what happened to the Marianas and why we're splintered from the perspective of the island people, the, the Chamos and the Carolinians. Indigenous historiography changes history. It does change history because it makes us co-creators of the narrative and we claim the language as a primary source. I'm gonna show you what this means in an example. Brendan Cruz, he's not here, he's in, uh, I think he's in Ponape now, uh, managing one of the branches of the Bank of Guam. But Brendan and I communicate regularly. I didn't know this young man until he approached me uh, through an email and asked if I could be the voice on his video that he was preparing as part of Festback. And I said, why my voice? And he said, I need a voice of a Sina. And I said, but there are many Sinas on Guam. And he just said, mm. and I thought, oh, okay. And then he said, 
uh, I heard that you're coming home. And I said, yeah, I'll be there actually in a few days, four or five days. And he said, we need to get this done right away. So I was in a studio with Brendan, whom I didn't really know, uh, the day after I arrived. I arrived, you know, 6.30 that night from the, on the Honolulu flight. And the following morning, I was in the studio at KUAM to give voice to this interpretation. He did a lot of research on the origin story. Now, many people know that story as Puntan and Fuuna, right? Well, Brendan challenged conventional historiography that way and said, Puntan means point, but what is the point of Puntan? And Fuuna is not a word. We know that the story was first recorded by a military wife, I think it was Margaret Higgins, uh, in the early 1900s. And she may have heard the story, the names in the story differently, he said. So he did research and found words that were closely related to Puntan and Fuuna. The word Puntan, P-O-N rather than P-U-N, is the word that describes the, when the coconut dies, when it gets brown and it goes back into the earth and sprouts, that thing that comes out of the brown coconut to develop into a full coconut tree is called pontan. So that process of, re, of rejuvenation, right? Of reincarnation of the coconut into, into a full grown living giving tree, that process is called puntan. And he thought, isn't that a more accurate way of naming the main, the main male character in the story? Then he says, fauna, what does that mean? We know what fauna means. Fauna means first. It means go ahead of, go ahead of. And so it makes all the sense in the world that the first mother, the female in the creation story who created the world, the people in the world, be named Fortna. So that, that, is, that is what goes behind his challenging conventional historiography to tell the story, the creation story, the Chamorro creation story, by renaming the characters, Pontan and Fona. We have to learn to be courageous because we have to support the young people who are willing to step out of the box, the conventional box. That's what I mean. There's a lot that we can harvest from our language. We've been listening to excerpts from the lecture of Dr. Laura Torres Souder on the topic Chamorro Revision Redefining Historical Periods, as presented at the Micronesian Area Research Center seminar series at the University of Guam in 2018. We'd like to thank Mark and Arlene Steffi for giving us permission to excerpt from this series and share these speakers with you. We'd love to hear your thoughts on the show. You can contact us on Facebook at 670 Humanities, or if you'd like to hear more of the show, subscribe to our YouTube channel at Northern Marianas Humanities Council. This has been your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry. This program was supported by a We the People grant awarded to the Northern Marianas Humanities Council from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities or the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Mm -hmm.